Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. I'm Nancy Messonnier, Director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at CDC. And I'm delighted to have you join us today for our partner webinar entitled Commem Commemorating 100 Years Since the 1918 Flu Pandemic. The 1918 flu pandemic was a historic global event that killed more people than World War I, II, and the Korean and Vietnam Wars combined. It is one of the most devastating health events in recorded world history. Next year marks 100 years since this historic event, and we at CDC would like to take this opportunity to recognize just how far we have come in our understanding of the influenza virus, our ability to monitor and track circulating viruses, and development of a vaccine, and in our nation's preparedness capabilities. We also know that there is much more work that can be done to make us better able to respond to the next pandemic. And we know that it is not a question of if we will have another pandemic, but a question of when. Today's webinar speaker is Dr. Jan Jernigan, Director of the Influenza Division at NCIRD CDC. Dr. Jernigan will provide a brief historic overview of the pandemic and highlight achievements over the past 100 years and also identify opportunities to improve our ability to detect and respond to pandemic influenza. Dr. Jernigan will also share information on CDC's commemoration objectives and resources to hopefully facilitate your organization's involvement in commemorating 2018 as the century of the 1918 pandemic, should you be interested in doing so. Most importantly, we're interested in hearing from you, our partners, on ideas for highlighting this historic event. We look forward to hearing from you and working with you over the coming year. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Jernigan. Thank you very much. So it's a great opportunity for me to, to talk with so many partners who have been with us for so many other activities. And I think this one in particular is a, an opportunity to talk about something that was terrible that happened many years ago that uh, could happen again, maybe. We'll, we're trying to predict that, trying to forecast that better. But at this point, I think it's good to see what happened, understand it, and see where we are now and figure out how are we ready really now to respond to something as devastating as happened in 1918. Even if it were half as bad, are we there right now? So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, go to the next slide here, if I can figure out my maneuvering here. So talk about a couple of things today. I want to talk about the 1918 pandemic first, uh, and then also talk about some of the current influenza threats uh, that we're seeing, especially from Asia right now, the influenza H7 and 9. Then talk a little bit about where we are with pandemic readiness, like Dr. Messonnier mentioned, and then uh, give some uh, inputs on, or get input from you on the 1918 commemoration activities that uh, are being planned, but also ways that the information that we talk about today can be incorporated into influenza messages uh, and into the uh, activities that you're doing with regard to pandemic and other uh, readiness and preparedness issues. Uh, if you go to the <clears throat> next slide here, to talk a little bit about influenza. So there is a significant annual burden of influenza in humans. Off on the left side, you can see the total numbers that we have from the United States. On the right, the global numbers. Really, uh, in a severe season, uh, you can have upwards of 56,000 deaths, 710,000 hospitalizations in the US alone, 35 million cases. And that's translated uh, to many more cases, of course, globally. These estimates globally are a little hard to, to, to get at, but some recent studies uh, that have come out uh, from Dr. Iuliano in our uh, influenza division actually have estimated upwards of 600 thousand uh, deaths occurring per year just from seasonal influenza alone. On this slide, you can actually see uh, the problem that we're talking about. Influenza, of course, as most folks know, is constantly changing. The reason that it's able to change is because the inside of the virus has separate genes that can be switched from one virus to another. And those inside genes actually code for the proteins that you can see on the outside of these uh, viruses here that are constantly changing to evade the human immunity. That's the reason why the virus can keep coming back each season, 
and causing uh, influenza among, uh, in the population. So human adapted viruses that are on the right can in certain settings be in the presence of uh, other viruses that are from avian or swine origin and at that point can actually exchange their genes and develop a whole new type of influenza virus. And so that's really what uh, can prompt a pandemic and that is a virus that has not been seen in the human population or has been not seen for a very long time and which is able to transmit from person to person in a very sustained way, meaning they can go from person to person to person, and in an efficient way. It can go from one person to more than one person. So once it achieves that, you can then have the transmission of a brand new virus within the population. And <clears throat> we've had four of those in the last 100 years, and I'll talk a little bit about those pandemics when they've occurred. On this slide, you can actually see the uh, lineages of the, vir the influenza A viruses that have been happening since 1918. Off to the left, you can see when uh, this 1918 H1N1 first showed up uh, with perhaps 675,000 deaths reported in the United States. It was with us for a number of years. Around 1947, there were some changes that uh, the H1N1 underwent that actually made it a little bit different than what was there previously. Uh, and in 1957, it was completely replaced by the H2N2 during the 1957 pandemic with around 116,000 deaths at that time. That virus was with us for around 10 years. And then in 1968, H3N2 showed up. And so we are commemorating not only the 100th anniversary of 1918, we're also commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 1968 pandemic with around 100,000 deaths at that time. H3N2 has been with us for those 50 years and has continued to change and continued to be the virus that is more likely to cause uh, severe uh, cases, hospitalizations, deaths, etc., relative to uh, H1N1. So H1N1 actually showed back up in 1977 for reasons that aren't exactly clear uh, and was with us uh, in the form that it was up until 2009 when H1N1, uh, but an H1N1 that was actually much more similar to what was happening back in 1918 reappeared in the U.S. population. And the reason it came was uh, that it, it came from humans in the 1930s, went into the pig population, was in pigs for a number of years, changing and reassorting, and then came back out uh, uh, it, probably in North America, uh, in Mexico, and then uh, began uh, going around the world very rapidly with the 2009 pandemic. So if going to the next slide, let me talk a little bit about the first of those, and that, of course, is the 1918 pandemic that we're uh, commemorating at the 100 years right now. So one thing that facilitated the, the uh, uh, transmission was crowding. And so these pictures, I think, really demonstrate what was happening, in, especially in urban areas where people were moving to cities so that they could um, get jobs and uh, assist with the war efforts that were really starting around that time. Uh, people were living in very close quarters, sometimes uh, sleeping uh, during the day and then going to work at night and somebody else sleeping in the beds. It was a very crowded situation because of industrialization and the war response. And in addition, because of that uh, World War I response, soldiers were also in very crowded conditions. Uh, sometimes 100,000 uh, were in tents uh, at one point, especially over the winter in 1917-18 where there was a very cold winter. Uh, so overcrowding, cold winter, and these are, you know, young men that were brought uh, from, say, Kansas uh, all the way across the U.S. and then put together. So a bunch of naive young uh, men that uh, were actually then uh, able to spread easily different kinds of infections, not just flu, but also measles and other things as well. Other things that were uh, aiding transmission was the wartime movement. These pictures, I think, tell a lot, especially the lower picture, I think, really uh, is the one that describes exactly uh, the issues that were there. There was massive troop movement. Uh, they were moving from, from towns, like I said, in maybe Kansas or elsewhere, to training bases and then to Europe. Uh, there were, for a period of time in the summer of 1918, 10,000 men being shipped to France every day. This was an unprecedented troop movement uh, that allowed infection to move from camp to camp. And it also allowed the virus to have opportunities for quickly getting around the globe 
uh, in naive populations that uh, just weren't probably there uh, in the previous century. Uh, what, where were the first cases? Uh, there's actually a lot of controversy around the, where these uh, where the cases of flu actually started. Some uh, actually believe, the historians believe that it may have actually started in the United States, in Kansas. The first reports uh, were in March 30th, 1918. They're actually, we were able to pull up uh, one of those reports and put it here. Uh, so it, it is possible that it, it started from a swine source uh, or from an avian source that had also some swine associated with it. But the funny thing is that the pandemic is often referred to as the Spanish flu. And it's not the Spanish flu because it came from Spain. It was called the Spanish flu because they were the first ones to talk about it. And I think that's actually an important point about the communications about uh, infectious diseases uh, during that time during the war. All those uh, countries that were combatants in World War I were not willing to mention that their troops might be decimated by a, an emerging pandemic, and so we're not talking about it. Spain was actually a non-combatant, and because of that, uh, refused to admit, they, they were ones that did not refuse to admit having cases and then got the moniker then of Spanish flu. Uh, other things happening at that time, it was the dawn of modern medicine. Uh, viruses had not been discovered yet. There was no flu treatment or prevention. Flu transmission was also poorly understood. Uh, there's a picture of a doctor down to the lower right, Dr. Pfeiffer, uh, who had identified a uh, bacillus, uh, which later was called Haemophilus influenzae because it was considered to be a, a cause of the uh, of, of influenza. Uh, it later turned out to be a secondary bacterial, uh, a likely secondary bacterial cause. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, this was considered to be probably one of the sources of the, of the pandemic. There were very few vaccines. There were only palliative therapies, including things like turpentine and beef tea, uh, things that may have caused more harm than actually helping. And one important point was that uh, greater than 30% of doctors and nurses were working for the military. So hospitals and clinics were greatly short-staffed because uh, a lot of the uh, uh, medical uh, group were actually trying to support the um, the war effort. Some signs and symptoms of the 1918 pandemic. I think the picture to the right really shows uh, graphically uh, what was actually happening uh, per person. This was a drawing put together so that they could help quickly explain to people uh, the, the phases of the illness. Most people, of course, had classic flu symptoms. Uh, in about 10 to 20 percent of cases, there was pneumonia. But uh, they described what was called purple death, where the uh, quotes uh, that are listed here, the, the, they very rapidly developed the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. Uh, cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over the face until it's hard to distinguish the colored men from the white. Uh, it takes special trains to carry away the dead. For several days, there were no coffins, and the bodies piled up something fierce. And then bodies stacked in the morgue from floor to ceiling like cordwood. So this was a terrible situation. And in fact, uh, a young uh, physician was asked what he should do to prepare uh, to go and assist with the uh, treating pandemic for the war effort. And uh, he was uh, told that you should learn how to build coffins. Uh, so this was a terrible time. Uh, with a significant amount of illness, especially in the younger individuals. The graph here at the top shows the three pandemic waves that came pretty quickly one after another with high fatality. There were an estimated 50, some say upwards of 100 million deaths globally. There were five times the military losses of, a, of World War I were due to the pandemic. And the graph to the lower graph there shows that the depressed overall average life expectancy of 12 years uh, because of what was happening in terms of the increased deaths uh, during the 1918 pandemic. One, how do we know why it was so severe? Uh, an interesting um, activity that happened in 1951 was with a researcher named Johann Hulten, uh, who you can see in the picture there to the upper left was with some other researchers uh, in Brevig Mission, Alaska, where they decided they would uh, uh, exhume 
some frozen bodies from Brevig Mission who had all died from uh, pandemic flu in 1918. They were able to find those bodies, get the appropriate pr approvals uh, from the tribe, and then uh, recover lung tissue. In 1951, in that uh, upper middle picture, you can see where Holton was actually trying to grow the virus but was not able to. Uh, and then in 1997, the same man heard about what was happening with Jeffrey Taubenberger, who was at, with the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at the time, where they were sequencing the virus from tissues directly. And so he decided to go back to the grave site, get the appropriate pr approvals, and recover additional frozen lung tissue. So he was able to do that, provide that to Jeffrey Taubenberger, who uh, began doing all of the sequencing on that. And then those, sequence, uh, those sequences of the virus were provided to Terry Tumpy, that's here at CDC, who was able to actually reconstruct and rescue the 1918 virus in the high containment lab there, and then do studies with that virus, with mice and with uh, other mammals, to determine what was the reasons why it was so severe. And he identified that there were some changes in the outer surface protein, the hemagglutinin, and with one of the polymerase uh, genes inside the virus that was associated with causing more severe disease. So this uh, rescuing of the virus really was using the latest technology at the time, which has continued to improve and is now able to let us see what was happening with that virus, even though it was 100 years ago. So of the three pandemics that are listed here, the H1 in 1918, the H2 in 57, and the H3 in 68, all three of these had hemagglutinin genes, that is the outer surface proteins, that uh, were of avian origin. And that's important uh, because of what we're seeing right now with some of the emerging new influenza viruses. One of them, let me spend a little time talking about because it's of concern to CDC and to WHO and others, the, of the H7N9 in Asia. This is a virus that uh, if you want more information on it, you can actually look at this uh, report from September 8th. Uh, there are others that are out there as well since that time uh, from the MMWR where we describe what happened during the fifth wave, uh, which was just last year, the 16-17 season. If you want to kind of uh, get a, a shorthand for H7 and 9, it's basically the risk factors are old men in bird markets. And so uh, it tends to happen more in men those that are over age 65, and de definitely those that have had exposure in the bird markets in China. This graph uh, shows the cumulative number of cases of H5N1, which is a, a, a concerning virus that we've been following for a number of years, as well as the H7N9, uh, which appeared in 2013. And so as you can see, the H7N9 cases have really increased dramatically, upwards of 1,500, and have outpaced the other most concerning virus that we had at the time, the H5. And so this rapid increase in the numbers of cases and the uh, distribution of the virus throughout China has made uh, it of great concern to us to monitor very closely. The uh, H7N9 in humans has about a 90% of them uh, develop pneumonia, 70% of them are admitted to the ICU, and 40% of the cases have died, so up around 1,500 cases, 40% have died. There have been clusters of infection. We, uh, through the China CDC and other partners, have investigated 35 of those. And there's not been any sustained or efficient human-to-human -human transmission. The fifth wave viruses, the ones from 2016-17, uh, are uh, certainly increasing in number. They're increasing in the numbers of uh, provinces where they're causing disease in China. They've been changing such that we now have to have a new pre-pandemic vaccine that the federal government has developed uh, for use in first responders in the United States. And the uh, subset of viruses are now actually causing significant disease in poultry. So almost 100% die off of certain flocks uh, due to this virus uh, now. So this is a bad virus. So it raises the question then, if something like the H7N9 were to appear, and we were able to, um, uh, um, and it were able to actually change. There's a study that actually just uh, came out not too long ago showing that just three changes to the genes in the H7 and 9 could make it more transmissible between uh, mammals and humans. So if that were to happen, are we ready for a pandemic like that? Um, 
there was a lot of discussion about this in the past, especially a renewed interest in pandemics during the mid 2000s. And there are a lot of factors that are associated with uh, the uh, potential for pandemic. The world is of course more crowded, it's more connected, and the worlds of humans and animals are increasingly converging. And if the 1918 pandemic were to occur today, it could result in tens of millions, some say upwards of 100 million deaths uh, globally, and would in fact probably around 20 to 30 percent of the global population for the first couple of waves. It would likely be potentially disruptive of transportation and supply chains. Uh, most of our, a lot of our food, a lot of our pharmaceutical supplies, a lot of our energy actually comes from outside the United States, so it could be disruptive in that way. And it certainly would be disruptive of healthcare services. Uh, this uh, season, there's a lot of folks going into the emergency departments, going into hospitals because of this year's seasonal flu. And you can see the impact that that's having in certain parts of the U.S. right now. You can imagine what would happen uh, in the U.S. if we were to have a much more fatal, higher, trans more transmissible uh, infection uh, due to a pandemic. The potential costs are also high. It's been estimated of around $181 billion for a pandu pandemic, uh, influenza pandemic. And then also for uh, looking back at SARS with the total amount that it cost was around $30 billion uh, in only four months. And so that's what we might expect. So what is the federal government doing? Uh, we've had planning tools and other uh, uh, tools out there, but uh, this year in April, there was a release of the 2017 uh, Health and Human Services Pandemic Influenza Plan. And it goes through the different uh, activities that are listed here on this one page. And so this actually helps us to say uh, this is what we should be working on. It's a strategy, uh, but there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of specific influenza pandemic planning at the state level and certainly in other countries as well. So looking at different parts of, the, of that uh, document, and just asking the question, are we ready? What are the strengths that we have that have uh, occurred in the last few years? And what are our gaps? From the standpoint of surveillance and diagnostic readiness, uh, the strengths are clearly that there's much greater global surveillance and reagent distribution for influenza. We currently distribute through our international reagent resource, um, uh, PCR testing reagents for 143 different laboratories around the globe that helps us to identify these novel viruses. We've had greatly improved domestic flu surveillance in the United States as well. And there are new technologies like next generation sequencing that's being performed at CDC for all the flu viruses that we receive, including a recent development that we have uh, in that picture at the bottom there of a handheld next generation sequencer that we can take into the field and actually test people and get results very quickly uh, to help determine what uh, the risk is and make decisions quickly about what to do. However, there are still lots of gaps. We clearly have inadequate surveillance in birds and swine, and there are places where we don't have information about what's happening with flu. Uh, some have referred to those as data deserts, especially in Africa and in other developing countries. With regard to treatment and clinical care, some strengths are that we have Yes, I think we had a little technical difficulty there, but can you hear me now? I'm looking at others in the room. Okay, sorry about that. So in terms of treatment and clinical care, you had a lot of opportunity to read this slide, I, I take it. Um, there are more antivirals, of course. Uh, they're listed there, including Paramavir, which is a new antiviral drug that's now available for intravenous use in children. Uh, there are also stockpiles maintained, certainly in the U.S. and in other uh, countries. 
that are available for use, but it's clearly not going to be enough in those stockpiles. But there are gaps. We need better performing antivirals. The current ones we have that are the neuraminidase inhibitors are just not as effective as they should be. They have to be used early in the course of illness. And so there's promise in the development of these new antivirals, but they're just not where they are now. We also need to have reusable respiratory protective devices and better ventilator access uh, if we were to have a significant pandemic that uh, in, uh, impacted uh, the healthcare system. And uh, many, I think, would indicate, especially those that are dealing with flu right now, that the healthcare system could get easily overwhelmed in a severe uh, pandemic. In terms of vaccine readiness, uh, we have better forecasting for which viruses are actually uh, the ones that should be put into the vaccine. We have new technologies like the ability to make the viruses to put in the vaccines. We can make vaccines in cells now instead of in eggs. We can have uh, vaccines that are made from proteins only, uh, not requiring eggs as well. And there's more manufacturing capacity available. And there are new programs like what's listed here, the PIVI program, for introducing vaccines for low and middle income nations. However, it just takes too long to have vaccine available for a pandemic response. And so things need to happen uh, to make the current system more efficient and, and more able to respond quickly to making a vaccine. And of course, it would be wonderful if we could have a better, uh, truly universal vaccine that we could give once or twice in life and have it cover all types of influenza. But that's going to be many years away. And so improving the current vaccines so that we can be better responding to pandemics, but also for treating flu is critical. In terms of pandemic planning and response, that we have better tools for responding to a pandemic. Uh, there's new frameworks and new mitigation guidance that you can find on the web at the CDC website. However, most countries don't have robust pandemic plans and very few exercise their response efforts. And an important issue that's been identified is that only a third of all countries are prepared to meet global health security and WHO readiness targets. So in, in conclusion, uh, regarding the 1918 and whether we're ready, influenza viruses are constantly changing, requiring ongoing surveillance and frequent vaccine virus changes. Pandemics can vary in severity. The 1918 pandemic was exceptionally severe. And if a similar pandemic were to happen today with that level of severity, it certainly would cause a significant uh, illness and death. The number of uh, detected um, uh, emerging novel influenza viruses is increasing, requiring ongoing laboratory and epidemiologic investigations for risk assessments. And efforts to improve pandemic readiness and response are underway. However, many gaps uh, remain. So uh, let me go over here. So let me talk then a little bit about some commemoration objectives and some resources uh, that are available. Uh, for uh, many of the partners to use as they, they would like. Um, the communication objectives uh, for this effort are to underscore the continued threat of pandemic influenza, uh, to highlight the public health achievements in influenza preparedness and response, to identify pandemic flu preparedness gaps and areas in, in need of further investment, uh, and empower people to act in order to decrease their risk of seasonal and pandemic influenza. The importance of vaccination, of course, and those actions that they can take, that an individual can take uh, to help to protect themselves, but also to protect their, their loved ones uh, during a pandemic. So those are the objectives. And what can the, the partners do? I think uh, the use of the 1918 commemoration as a platform for collective public health preparedness messaging is important. And how can that be done? Uh, through communications. Uh, collaborating with CDC and, and, and other agencies and other uh, academic facilities and collaborating with each other on creative communications activities, uh, having events, uh, incorporating 1918 messaging into conferences or meetings and press events. Uh, some of those are already becoming, uh, uh, you can see them on the web, but I think there's an opportunity for a lot more of these other events that could uh, incorporate 1918 into the, uh, to the uh, presentation. And then other creative ideas that we would love to hear from you to share with us uh, that you think would be useful for spreading the word 
uh, about what happened in 1918, but also about how we can become more prepared uh, and how we can also take uh, measures now for seasonal influenza as well. So what are some of the re resources for the partners? Uh, there is a 1918 commemoration webpage that will be available to folks. Uh, that's currently nearing the end of development, but uh, we will that will be available to folks. Uh, there are master key points uh, and messaging that uh, is available uh, specifically on this topic that helps bridge to other uh, preparedness and influenza issues. Uh, infographics uh, will be available and a digital timeline from 1918 uh, to the present. So, so um, it would be nice to uh, have your support uh, and we would love to hear your ideas on, on ways that the commemoration can be incorporated into communications and events uh, and other activities. Um, some CDC examples of some activities include a uh, symposium that we're planning with Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, there are other things like this from other academic institutions that are happening and integrating 1918 into conferences and presentations, uh, plenary sessions and publications. So uh, at this point, I think it would be great to uh, follow up with folks on the um, uh, on what your ideas are uh, that uh, uh, that you can contact us at that web excuse me at that email address that's at the top there with your follow up questions with your 1918 events that you might want to add to your uh, calendars and requesting any CDC support if you would like in terms of uh, connecting with partners or resources uh, or event assistance, etc. And so we would love to have that uh, information from you. I'm going to actually skip to a couple of slides here just since I have everyone captive on the phone and we're having a pretty significant season just to point out that this season is an H3 in two year. I've just put up what's called the ILI net graph, which just shows the numbers of people going to outpatient facilities for influenza-like illness. The red line with the triangles is this year. The pink line or purple line, whatever that is, is the 2014-15 season. And you can see that they are tracking right on top of each other. So the earliness of the 14-15 season uh, is what we're seeing this year as well. Both of those seasons were an H3 and 2 uh, season a predominant H3 and 2 season. 2014-15, many of you remember it being a very severe season. Uh, and this year, although it's it's hard to say exactly, but the severity of this year may turn out to be somewhat similar uh, to what we had in 2014-15. It's going to take a little time for that information to, to completely come in. On the last slide here, like I said, it is occurring earlier. It's similar to 2014-15. Most of the viruses are influenza A, and most of those are H3 and 2 so far. Um, there's no significant drift that we've seen of any of the four circulating viruses. However, for the influenza A H3 and 2 component of the vaccine, uh, there are some egg-based changes that we've seen in the last few years when H3 is circulating that make that egg-based vaccine virus less similar to what's circulating than the non-egg-based vaccines like the flu block or the flu cell vax. Uh, and that uh, are a unfortunate problem with the H3 virus trying to grow in eggs. It's something that uh, people just cannot get around. Uh, recent seasons where AH3 and 2 has been predominating, there have been higher hospitalizations uh, and the vaccine effectiveness tends to be lower. So with that, I'm going to head back to the uh, slide here. And I think uh, at this point, uh, folks have been putting their questions uh, up and let me see if I can just call this up. Okay, so uh, a first uh, question that uh, came through uh, through the text uh, part of the webinar was from Amy Kanata. Uh, it says, one of the issues with the 1918 flu pandemic was the health and public officials refused to acknowledge it was happening. In their denial, they encouraged people to do things like attend mass events that worsened the situation. Are we in a place today where officials would be more likely to quickly acknowledge and act on a pandemic? It's a great question. I think uh, really pointing out uh, the issue that was mentioned earlier in the talk about the war effort. And so there were so many factors then that uh, were leading to perhaps poor communication messaging and poor decisions around communication. And so because of that, uh, the, the uh, um, 
description of what was happening just was not, people were not willing to uh, admit that. And uh, I think it's clear from a number of the historical record and from the um, reports that we have from back then that uh, people were more interested in getting uh, war bonds <laughs> than they were in communicating about a rapidly spreading severe pandemic. I would hope that we're in a very different place now. Uh, I think our experience through 2009 really demonstrated that being out front, communicating that something was happening, also communicating the uncertainty of what was happening and letting folks know that there are things that they can do uh, that would uh, help mitigate things. And there are things that uh, both the federal government, the clinicians and others are also doing uh, to try and, and mitigate the problem. So I'm hoping we're in a much better place than we were uh, back then. Uh, so uh, next question comes from Peter Kirakopoulos. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm not supposed to read all this, but excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, the 20, he states, the 2014 Ebola outbreak produced incidents where the U.S. healthcare system did not provide the expected standard of care, perhaps out of fear or confusion. What is being done and should be done to prevent the recurrence of this behavior should a pandemic occur? Um, you raise a very important uh, issue. And e Ebola and flu are different in, in many ways. If we uh, if Ebola had taken off, I think, uh, as some might have uh, were concerned about, <clears throat> it would have been a person-to-person a -person transmission, but much more of what we would call contact transmission, a much slower uh, moving thing that you can actually use more traditional um, methods to prevent. Um, <clears throat> even so, in areas where they did have those cases, there was a considerable amount of concern, of course, in the population, questions about the capability of healthcare workers to appropriately protect themselves against it. Um, this question is really getting at, if we had a, a severe pandemic, we would actually not just have pockets of cases like Ebola, <clears throat> it would be happening everywhere and therefore the system would get overwhelmed. Um, because of that, uh, there are efforts to look at what are called alternative standards of care. Uh, there are also ways that we can take um, existing uh, materials, like for instance, a t-shirt. We're actually looking at CDC to figure out how can you use uh, t-shirt material, fold it over several times and use it as a mask for protecting oneself in the community. So there's efforts around trying to find some alternative ways in the community that people could uh, protect themselves. And then in healthcare settings, there's a lot of efforts to try and have better respiratory protective devices, ones that could be reused things like that. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I think the, uh, this, the, if we had a significant, severe pandemic, it would be, uh, could be devastating. And so there has been discussion about alternatives of care, that is determining who gets care, et cetera. That's a very complicated uh, topic, but uh, there are ethicists and others that uh, are working on that. And some efforts have been put into that as well, but clearly we need to have that articulated uh, prior to us ever having something as severe as the 1918 again. And we've been asked for summarizing some questions here, but um, who decides what is considered a pandemic? Address that. So a pandemic, just by definition, like we've mentioned, is where you have a novel influenza virus uh, for which the population has either no immunity or have very little immunity to, and which can transmit efficiently from one person to more than one person and can be sustained. So that's the simple definition of it. Uh, during 2009, the actual global determination, the call, uh, was made by WHO. Prior to that, though, many countries, <clears throat> we all knew what was actually happening. Uh, but I think to, to have it called a pandemic, uh, the WHO, actually, the emergency committee is the one, I think, that, that makes the final call. However, uh, whether it's called or not doesn't really matter. Uh, the activities that the CDC and the federal government will be doing in order to begin that mitigation cascade of, of activities uh, will happen. And so, in fact, even with the emergence of a novel influenza virus uh, in China, where there may be two or three cases, we begin that pandemic response by characterizing the virus, 
developing vaccines, making sure the diagnostics can pick it up, and determining whether the antivirals will be effective or not. So responding to potential pandemics occurs all the time. Whether it's called a pandemic is, uh, from the global standpoint, we, we work with WHO on that, but from the response standpoint, the U.S. government <laughs> acts much quicker than that. Can you also describe the infrastructure, the importance of infrastructure in public health in responding to a pandemic? So in the United States, a, a mantra, our seasonal activities are the infrastructure for our pandemic activities. And so whether they are adequate or not, or whether they can scale up is a different question. But our belief is that the best way to be prepared is by having systems that are routinely doing that kind of work. And so for 2009, we were able to move from weekly reporting up to daily reporting. We added new surveillance systems. We had a whole series of new communication activities, uh, a number of mitigation and community mitigation activities. All of that was done uh, built on existing infrastructures, at least from the CDC standpoint. The Vaccine was even delivered using the existing uh, vaccine contracts and the vaccine systems that we have with vaccines for children. All of that, we feel that having the existing infrastructure used for pandemic uh, is important. Is it sufficient? Uh, that's a good question. And one way that we look into that is by having exercises so that we check to see, is the system that we think going to be used for a pandemic able to do it? And so we can do that through exercises and frankly, through the 2009 pandemic, which was sort of the biggest exercise for a bad pandemic. Another question we have is, um, what do we think is needed to actually improve flu vaccine? So what do we think is needed to improve? I'll refer to the current vaccines that are out there. And so um, currently, we are able to monitor what's happening with influenza viruses and we can say what the currently circulating viruses are, which the, what are the predominant ones. And we're even using forecasting now with uh, mathematical modelers and others to try and pick those viruses that are on their way up, the emerging viruses. So that activity, I think, can tell us what's happening. The issue right now is that the vaccine requires about six months for it to be prepared. And so from the time that a decision is made to start making the vaccine until when it can be injected into people can be six months. And so in that time, uh, you can see changes in the, in the vaccine, excuse me, in the, in the viruses that are circulating is what happened in 2014-15. In addition, there we are seeing for one component, the H3N2 component, that when they grow in eggs, which is required for the majority of the vaccine out there, there can be changes, there are changes that occur in that virus in order for it to grow in the manufacturing process that make it less similar than what's actually circulating. And for that reason, uh, having technologies that may not use eggs or uh, finding ways to get viruses that look the same but can grow in eggs, that would be one uh, factor that would be helpful. Things that we are seeing right now, though, are increased antigen dose, like in those that are over age 65 with the high dose vaccine, and also the use of adjuvants, uh, Fluad and other products that are out there now uh, that, uh, that use adjuvants. So all of these technologies could possibly make incremental improvements in the vaccine. We'd love to see that. If you can get the vaccine effectiveness just a little bit better, uh, you can actually save significant numbers of cases and, and, uh, and deaths. Uh, just with improvements in, in the vaccine effectiveness uh, of just even 5%. So we look forward to seeing those things. They're happening now as we speak with the high dose, the, the adjuvanted, the new technologies that are being used. We would love to see more of that uh, to make better vaccines. Um, <clears throat> there's a question from Michael Parker that uh, uh, saying that I heard this flu season has been more severe is there a mismatch or is it just because H3N2 is the predominant strain this year? So the main answer to that is it's the H3N2 because uh, any year we have H3N2, we will have more hospitalizations, more cases, more deaths, and it clearly disproportionately impacts those that are at highest risk, those that are over age 65 and the very young. So H3N2 is the primary driver 
when we look at the H3 and 2 viruses that are actually causing disease this year, they don't look that different than what was with us last year uh, based on the testing that we perform of looking at the outside proteins on the, on the virus. However, we do see that the, uh, those, that, those viruses, when they have to grow in eggs, which is the majority of the vaccine, they are less similar to what's actually circulating. And so for that reason, there may be an associated lower vaccine effectiveness. We do see in H3 predominant years a vaccine effectiveness of around mid-30s and 30% that uh, it happens whenever we're having, that's the overall uh, vaccine effectiveness over 10 years uh, for H3 and 2. So when we get H3 and 2, it's a, bad, it's a worse bug and a, the uh, vaccine effectiveness is not as good. And that might be because of some of the egg changes. We've got a question about what businesses can do to prepare um, and help people from, uh, keep people from going to work sick and things like that in the event of a pandemic. Right, I think the, uh, <clears throat> both in the pandemic, but also in, in with seasonal flu, uh, one thing is just to allow workers to stay home if they're ill. Uh, we, we know that people want to work and the worst ones are probably the doctors and nurses that come in. And so making it possible for people to be able to telework, uh, making it possible for them to stay home and not infect others, uh, also even allowing them to be in a, a place at work where maybe they're separated, those are things that uh, definitely can uh, help in terms of social distancing, that is getting them away from each other uh, so that they're not transmitting as easily. Um, that's hard, but uh, that's something that can be encouraged, especially teleworking, uh, to help people to do that. Um, doing va vaccine campaigns at work is very helpful because uh, then it makes it easy for people to get vaccinated and that, that impact from the vaccine can also help mitigate uh, the issues with seasonal flu. And then there are on the CDC website and also on the CDC Foundation website, tools for businesses that you can uh, access for uh, uh, making sure that businesses are thinking about pandemic and how to respond to them and including influenza seasonal. There's checklists and other things like that uh, and tools uh, to help folks that are in occupational health and that uh, are over those kinds of issues at large corporations. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, questions that you have uh, given. We would love to hear from folks uh, regarding the what you would like to see with the use of 1918, it was a significant period of time historically. It had an impact on our uh, survivability. <laughs> it actually is something that you can see uh, clearly the, the amount of impact from deaths due to uh, the 1918 pandemic. Remembering that 100 years later I think is important. It, it's, it makes it clear to us that there are things we can do to get ready. Influenza is a severe disease, and so we want to take it seriously and make sure that if something like this were to happen again, that we would be more prepared uh, than we are. So with that, thank you very much, and uh, look forward to hearing from you all.